Greetings. This is Doc Ock coming to you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central. We're getting ready to get for real today. Okay, well, we're featuring another woman today. I had planned on featuring a man, but uh, apparently I forgot that we had not finished the story of Susie Revels Caton yet. So I wanted to go ahead and finish off her story. Didn't want to do the sister wrong. So the proverb for today is, if you are building a house and a nail breaks, do you stop building or do you change the nail? Proverb is, if you are building a house and a nail breaks, do you stop building or do you change the nail? And that is a proverb from Rwanda Burundi. Poem for today, which I may have read before, but I'm not quite sure. So if you think you heard it before, that's only because you did. But even if you did, it's a good poem and it's short. So here we go. From the mind of Gil Scott Heron from the book, So Far So Good. Poem for today is Beginnings, the First Minute of a New Day. We're sliding through completely new beginnings. We're searching out our every doubt and winning. We want to be free, and yet we have no idea why we are struggling here. Faced with our every fear just to survive. We've heard the sound and come around to listening. We've touched the vibes time after time, insisting that we know what life means Still, we can't break away from dues we've got to pay. We hope we'll somehow say that we're alive. Mm -hmm. And there you have it. The first minute of a new day beginnings. So let's go ahead and finish off the story of Susie Rebels Caton, the voice of the people. The voice of the people. Let's see where we are here today. Ah, here we go. Right where I left off at. Nope, I better keep these on. All right. Um, right, and we left off at, he seemed to be, this is when um, Susie had, it was getting together with her husband, okay? When 37-year-old Horace Caton wrote and asked, for 26-year-old Susie's hand in marriage, she accepted. He seemed to be going places, and that was just what Susie intended to do herself. There's every reason to believe that the Reverend Hiram Revels approved of the ambitious Caton, for they shared many of the same ideals. Rebels knew that his future son-in-law appreciated his daughter for her own ideas and recognized her abilities. For months that year, Susie had been writing stories that Horace published in his newspaper. In the 1896 New Year's edition of the Seattle Republican, there appeared an article by Miss Susan Sumner Revels concerning Booker T. Washington and the Atlanta Exposition, which was well-received. Horace Caton publicly praised her contributions, stating for his readership, she gives every evidence of becoming a very forcible and effective writer and seems especially adapted to fiction and verse. Upon approval of their engagement, the soon-to-be Mrs. Horace Caton chose to move to the Northwest. Miss Rebels took a train to Seattle where her fiancé respectfully found living arrangements for her until the time of their wedding. She was a tall, pretty woman with a gentle, warm demeanor who exuded grace and class. Her marriage to Horace would bring him prestige. July 12, 1896 was a beautiful summer day for the couple to exchange their vows. The wedding was held at the Seattle home 
of Mr. A.J. T. Edwards, the Reverend Shanklin of the First Methodist Episcopal Church officiated. Two families with distinctly different backgrounds, yet who shared common bonds, were united in marriage. Both the rebels and Catons had a mixed racial ancestry. Unlike Susie's family, though, Horace traced his heritage to slavery, never quite certain of his parentage. Horace's father or stepfather and his mother raised him on a plantation for the first six years of his life. It wasn't until the end of the Civil War that the Catons were freed. Susie would come to know of the gruesome experiences that the elder Caton had as a slave. Though she could not personally identify with slavery, she knew that it was a part of her husband and that their children would have a heritage, both slave and free. Susie had much in common with her husband. However, both were college educated, intellectuals with interest in journalism and backgrounds in teaching and writing. They both came from Christian households with strong morals and both knew the importance of hard work. They shared a passion for justice and their contributions would move Seattle toward racial equality. The fact that white supremacist Southerners were generally Democrats caused many Blacks, including Susie Rebels Caden and her husband, to identify with Lincoln's Republican Party. And the very Republican, Mr. and Mrs. Horace Caton, were eager to make a life for themselves in Seattle, which in the latter half of the 19th century was known as a place where Blacks were given a fair shake. There were no black laws restricting their rights, as was the case in Oregon. Seattle had, had a reputation as being less prejudiced than other areas of the country. It was a place where Susie believed that her hopes and dreams might be realized for that no road was too long. For that, no road was too long. The Seattle Republican, which Horace Caton founded, was the second black newspaper in Seattle. In a 10-year period prior to 1901, a total of seven black weekly newspapers appeared in Seattle. Most were strongly partisan, but all strove to improve the situation for blacks in society. The Republican was a biracial newspaper intended for both a black and white readership. Several years after the couple married, their newspaper became very prosperous. Susie Caton was acknowledged publicly by her husband as the force behind its success. The Seattle Republican was clearly Republican in its bent, and at every chance it sought to show the black race in a good light. The Catons publicized those participating in acts of community service, civic responsibility, or any accomplishments of note. Susie had begun writing around the age of 10. Several of her stories from that period exist today, such as, quote unquote, liquor, L-I-C-K-E-R, and, quote unquote, the storm, end quote. Her love of Writing continued her whole life, and she had a genuine flair for the pen. Besides helping to run the Republican, Susie was a regular contributor. She had studied both journalism and nursing in college. But her love was journalism. Besides the Caton's own newspaper, her stories appeared in the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, a white newspaper. It's June 3rd. 1900 issue ran a piece titled Sally the Egg Woman, an essay about the mysterious doings of a devoted elderly black woman caring for a demented young woman in her charge. The piece clearly showcased Susie's talent and was apparently well received by the paper's readership. Other newspapers commented favorably 
on her writing as well. In 1900, Susie Rebels Caton became associate editor of the Seattle Republican. The papers masthead prominently displayed her name and the title she so richly deserved. Susie contributed articles, editorials, and short stories. The journal touted that it was the only paper in the Northwest successfully edited by a Negro. The Catons could attribute its success to keeping to the four R's, always regular, readable, reliable, and, of course, Republican. Susie's work also earned the praise of the Seattle Times, a white newspaper. Her husband publicly acknowledged her contributions to the success of their newspaper by printing the associate hereof and likewise life partner of the editor has more than borne her part. All honor is due to such women. The Catons were one of the most prominent, wealthy, and respected black families in Seattle. In 1903, Susie and her family moved to the prestigious Capitol Hill, where they lived in an eight-room, two-story home with a carriage house. She gave birth to two sons, one in 1903 and another in 1907, while living at 518 14th Avenue. Susie was part of the elite black middle class living in an affluent white neighborhood. The small group of upper class blacks was always busy planning social get togethers such as picnics, sightseeing trips, barbecues, dinner parties, and balls. Other members of black society did the same, even if on a much reduced scale. Family and fellowship bonded people together while her husband combined politics and journalism to make a living. Susie preferred community outreach to, co to complement her love of journalism. As a college educated newspaper editor, her visibility enabled her to become a leader in social and civic circles. She supported cultural events and encouraged participation. Susie was a proponent of active community life joining organizations and inspiring others to do the same. She was especially active in the Sunday Forum, an all-Black group formed to promote discussion of issues of concern within their community. Their unified front carried clout. If businesses that Blacks patronized refused them employment, for instance, they could threaten to withdraw their support until the situation was rectified. Susie was a participant and speaker at this bi-monthly club, which met over a four-year period. Susie was also a founding member of the Marcus Club, a charity group in which she held several leadership roles. At one point, she saw a need for Black girls to have Black baby dolls rather than white ones and went about seeing to the change. What Susie Rebels Caton recognized was the importance of social uplift. She also realized the value of an education in helping to bring families out of poverty. Ignorance, she knew, kept black women down. Self-esteem is essential for black women after the demoralizing experiences of the slavery era, which had ended for many as recently as 1865. The women Susie knew were either former slaves or children of former slaves. Susie tried to help uplift these those women who were trying desperately to distance themselves from their past. Besides keeping their family unit intact, black women had to offer financial support. Their husbands typically could only find low paying jobs. Susie wanted employment opportunities for these women, other than as domestics or laundresses. Equally important, she wanted them to have their self-respect. She found that most women believed they might never see their own hopes and aspirations realized, but believed that their children's lives and opportunities might be much improved. 
Susie was able to balance work or working outside the home at the paper and her social outreach, as well as raising her children. She would have five children, three girls and two boys born over the space of 17 years in Seattle. Though the children were just one generation removed from slavery, they were expected to be leaders in society. Service and achievement were paramount. Susie's high expectations for her own children were seen in her insistence in having them use standard English. They were admonished to show the best of manners at all times to improve the image of blacks. They were expected to be a credit to their race. For a while, Susie and her family seemed to be living the American dream in which hard work secured success and civic involvement assured acceptance. However, as racial unrest intensified in Seattle, Susie saw their world begin to crumble. The changing social climate certainly contributed to the, to the decline of the Seattle Republican in 1909. Susie stood by and watched as her husband lost a legal battle after he'd been refused service in a restaurant. The couple was accused, too, of causing their neighborhood's real estate value to depreciate. It was further proof that they were losing their respect and standing in the white community. After all their work to promote harmony, it was disheartening to see the color line return to prominence as it was across the country. The financial losses that Susie's family suffered as a result reduced their station in life. In 1909, after six years of living in the enviable Capitol Hill, the Catons were forced to move. The first of several relocations. They lived in a small house near the Laurel, a 23-room boarding house that they owned and operated on 22nd Avenue South. Susie had long since let go the Japanese servant and Swedish maid whom they had employed. Some real estate investments that did not pan out depleted their savings, as did civil lawsuits Horace was involved in. Susie did all she could to hold the family together and help make ends meet. By then, her children were 12, 8, 6, and 2 years old. She would give birth to their fifth child, a daughter, in 1914. Still, the Seattle Republican struggled to survive as businesses pulled their advertisements and subscriptions decreased. The policy of the Seattle Republican had been to work through difficulties between the races by full and free discussion of them, but tackling sensitive race issues openly in the paper was not well received. Between 1890 and 1900, more than 1,200 lynchings took place in the Deep South, and the Catons' insistence on publishing accounts of these horrific acts, as well as rapes of Black women and more, offended their white readership. On May 13, 1913, the last edition of the Seattle Republican was printed. It had run for 19 years. After the paper failed, Susie saw her husband lose his position of influence in the white Republican machine that he had long supported. Over the years, she had watched her husband bring distress to her family through printing his outspoken views, name calling, and refusal to just sit back and take it. She supported her family when some of these causes left him in jail, as unjust as the arrests were. At times, she was frightened for her life and the lives of her children, but she endured their reversal of fortune and status with grace under pressure. In 1916, Susie and Horace had enough money to start another newspaper, Caton's Weekly. Fighting back against discrimination, the paper was distinctly aimed at a black circulation. It continued to report atrocities committed against blacks to incite people to action. As a contributing editor of Caton's Weekly, Susie did not always agree with the degree to which her husband reported such injustices, but she sympathized with his conviction. And my time has just run out. 
Let me see. I'm going to finish this paragraph right here. Conversely, the paper ran stories of accomplishments and contributions of blacks to society in order to promote a good image of the race. The paper ran until 1920 and was soon replaced by Caton's Monthly. That had a, re a run of just two issues. And we have to leave off there. So, um, we'll, uh, well, we're not going to be able to finish this up tomorrow because tomorrow is Saturday and we won't be able to do it on Sunday either. So, but what I'll do, maybe I'll read just the end of that piece on Monday. But if not, suffice it to say, you've got the majority of the story of the Catons. They went from riches, quote unquote, to rags. Okay. So kind of a reversal of, of fortunes here because they started off very high and ended up not quite so high. But the story still had a good ending. I just can't tell you what it is right now. But look them up. Check them out. Do your research. The information is out there. You can find it just like I did. In the meanwhile, we'd like to wish everybody a, a, a good weekend. And um, we will be black tonight at 9. And then, you know, on, the, on tomorrow and Sunday, we'll be doing our weekly rewind, Doc Ox re weekly rewind. And we will be um, doing that at noon, as always. Adults, the adult portion on, on a Saturday, the children's per portion on Sunday. Go ahead and make your donations below. Go ahead to our, our website. You can donate at our GoFundMe page. And um, you can also donate. What was your third way? Oh, you can also, or if you like, you can just send us a, you can just send us some funds directly right through PayPal. That's a good way to do it too. The email address is kkhemet at gmail.com. And we appreciate your time, your patience, and your donations. Peace out, y'all.